Yeah, OK, so, um, okay, so maybe I should first say, so this is joint, um, joint work in progress with uh, Ralph Klückers and Silva Rideau. OK, and so our goal is to come up with an analog of O minimality in valued field. And maybe you're already wondering, and maybe I should fix my t title. Um, so there are already quite a lot of analogs of O minimality in valued field, so why yet another one? Um, so um, let me mention the existing ones. So existing. Maybe, or let me ju just fix my notation first before I forget. So notation, k will always be denote a valued field. And then I write OK for the valuation ring. And I denote the valuation by v and the value group by gamma. And I also have infinity here. And I denote by little k the residue field, and here I have the residue map. OK, and I will consider all this in some language. So L is a language which contains the language on, of rings. And then, I mean, actually, it contains your favorite language on valued fields. So maybe the easiest way would be to put some divisibility predicate on it, or make it a multi-sorted language if you want. Um, well, anyway, I'd, OK. So and this, I mean, recall the notion. I mean, so I would be only interested in such notions on fields. So recall in the O minimal setting, you would say, OK, I have the, a real closed field. I have an expansion of the language of fields. And then O minimality is a condition on those expansions, which implies that definable sets behave nicely somehow that I mean lot, imply lots of geometric results. So that's what we also want in valued fields. We have an expansion of this language and we want to put conditions on this so that things behave nicely. And so existing notions for this, for, of such niceness of expansions, <laughs> existing Notions, I mean, maybe um, we'll forget some. I mean, there's C minimality, which Francoise talked about yesterday. Um, then there's V minimality, which is a notion which Khrushchevsky and Kajdan used in their article about motivic integration. And so both of these notions. They essentially, I would say, they only make sense in algebraically closed valued fields. So, in, so for k algebraically closed, I mean, I guess they probably imply that k is algebraically closed, but I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, okay, good. And then there's p minimality. And this is for k periodically, uh, so, uh, so elementarily equivalent to a finite extension of QP. OK, so all of these notions are uh, for some rather specific classes of valued fields. And so what we wanted is a notion, I mean, model theory is known to behave well, well in a much larger class of valued fields. And we wanted a notion which applies, well, to, if possible, to the entire class, to all valued fields where the model theory is known to behave nicely. Um, so um, go. Notion that works. So, in particular, it should work if I just take the pure valued fields language. 
I want um, that k is allowed to be Hanselian. of characteristic, um, well, 0, 0 maybe, that's a setting which works particularly well, but also um, characteristic 0, P would, I mean, it would be nice if it even works in that setting, and actually that's what we obtain. So we will obtain, and yeah, so this, and then, so it works means that if I take K, any such field K, with a pure valued field language, then it will be minimal in the sense of our new notion. By the way, VF minimal, it's how we call it. And, um, and then one can add additional language, like, I mean, as in the reals, you would add maybe, maybe analytic functions. Here you can also add analytic function and it will stay VF minimal. Okay, and maybe I should also say, so all this is kind of motivated by various applications. So in a, um, I mean, already here you've seen various, uh, say, big geometric results about model theory in val of valued fields. And most of the, res I mean, many of the results you've seen, they a priori maybe do them in the pure valued field language here. But then you notice that the same proof works also with some analytic structure on it. And the question is, what do you really need for it to work? And so our goal here was to find good axioms which make all these things work. So for example, um, so maybe I write this down, motivation is the applications. For example, we'd want that in such a VF minimal structure that we have motivic integration works in this setting I mean, I'm not yet saying that everything already works there, but I mean, that's what the plan is. Then there's this kind of um, Pilar Wilkie-like stuff, which Francois mentioned this morning. Um, um, so motivic, let me write motivic um, Pilar Wilkie. Um, then there's, I mean, I, uh, there's this, notion of stratifications I came up with, or T-stratifications, also all the things which um, Raf and Julia talked about, this kind of um, formalism of loci, um, so CX functions and loci, also this is something one would like to work in this setting. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's the goal. And so maybe one thing I should already say, so here now I wrote just Hanselian valued field. So this in particular means no condition on the residue field. So the residue field could, for example, be Q. And of course, model theory of Q is not nice. And so if this is supposed to be some, I mean, this, this notion of VF minimality is supposed to say something that model theory is nice. So the only thing you can expect is that it's kind of nice relative to the value valued field. So it's kind of a modulo the valued field, it's nice, something like that. Uh, re sorry, residue field. Modulo residue field. So philosophy maybe. Um, model theory, so let me already write, so VF minimality, that's how we call our notion, implies model theory nice modulo the residue field, and actually, um, okay, let me first write it like this, and change it in a second. So, um, I mean, I guess most of you know Denev pass quantify elimination. So if I have a Hanselian valued field of equicharacteristic zero in a suitable language, I ha can eliminate any valued field quantifiers. 
And so this is obviously also su exactly such a kind of relative statement because it, I mean, doesn't say what happens in the value field and in the residue field, and it allows the residue field to be arbitrary. And this is moreover also true even if you expand the language on the residue field arbitrary. I mean, anyway, you don't control the residue field, so you can as well expand the language arbitrarily. And it also works if you expand the language on the value group arbitrarily. So in some sense, it's not just modulo residue field. I mean, this, at least this quantif elimination result. It's also modulo the value group. And that's also what we want to do. So let's also not just take modulo residue field, but also and modulo the value group. Which means, yeah, so that we want to say, um, essentially we'd like to say that if something is VF minimal and I expand my language arbitrarily on there or on there, on a combination of both actually, then um, things are, st I mean, it stays VF minimal. So here you end up with zero, zero, right? You just um, yes, uh, actually, um, yes, yeah. so if, if I'm characteristic zero P, then I have to say not, not just modular um, residue field, but some kind of residue rings. It becomes a little bit more technical. And actually, maybe let me already say right away for the remainder of the talk uh, from now on, assume characteristic 0, 0. Also, I mean, so our notion works in mixed characteristic, but it's more technical. So for this talk, let me stay in this setting. OK, so that's the philosophy. And now, OK, so how can we, how could one define such a notion of minimality? Um, no? No. Um, so, recall that, I mean, in O minimality, I mean, this is really a very, very simple axiom. It just describes how definable subsets of the line have to be, or of the field itself. So, and um, so essentially, that's also what we will do here. So, um, we will, so the idea is, so we will specify what definable subsets of the fields itself are. And in some sense, I mean, I can already tell you, VF minimality will be just saying definable subsets of the field have to be exactly the ones which I expect, or not more than the ones which I allow. And the, and only additional difficulty is compared to O minimality is that I have to be very precise about parameters. So, okay, I'll say details about this later. But, okay, now I should, I, actually I should have written this on this blackboard maybe. Here I wrote modulo the residue field and the value group. But, I mean, some of you already have this, seen this RV thingy. So, this residue field and the value group can be combined to one single thing one usually calls R V, and this is, plays an important role here, so let me introduce this. Uh, so R V is, if you want, take the valued field as a, the multiplicative group, and then we have one plus the maximal ideal. Oh, I didn't introduce that notation. I hope it's clear nevertheless. This is a multiplicative subgroup, and I take this quotient here. This is a group still a group, and that's my RV essentially, except that I also want, I want to have a map from K to RV, and now zero doesn't have an image here, so let me just artificially add some point zero here. And maybe, so, I mean, formally if you want, there's a little, ex let me write it maybe down in a corner, you always have an exact sequence, RV without the zero, goes to the value group, and the kernel of this map is the residue field. So from that point of view, this is really just a combination of the residue field and the value group. And maybe let me 
give a down-to-earth example to give a better feeling of how this looks like. Actually, this map here should I denote it by little rv. So if k is c double brackets t, for example, then I have an, if I have an element of this here, this will be some power series a i t to the i, where i goes from 1 to infinity. And let's say that a n is non-zero, so my n here is really the first coefficient. Then what is our v of this here? Well, it's essentially, I mean, let me, I mean, I'm slightly abusing notation here maybe. It's, so what does it know about this element? It knows its valuation, so which is n, and it knows the leading coefficient, so the a n. And here you see, this is, I mean, here you see how rv, I mean, here in, in this example here, I have a canonical way in which this rv splits as a product of this and this, namely the valuation of the element and its leading coefficient. Exactly. So in, in general, I don't give a splitting, but yeah, just, yeah. But if you want, everything also works with a splitting, if you prefer to think with a splitting, but okay. Okay, so this was just to give you a little bit of an intuition of this RV. Maybe I want to give a second uh, way, a second intuition. Let me draw a picture. So again, in this same example, so this is, let me, for example, let me for simplicity draw C double brackets T. So this is supposed to be the valuation ring. And then I have the maximal ideal here. This is T times C double brackets T. So now, for example, here I have a translate of this maximal ideal. This will be all the series starting with a one. So this ball here, this is one, the pre-image of one element in, from Rv. So this here is, so this ball is one fiber of the Rv map and similarly, series which start with any other element. So I don't know, five over two plus t times ct. This is another fiber of the Rv map and so on. And then here, these are the series which start with a zero. And then the Rv map will look at the coefficient one. So here again, I have a partition. I mean, here in the middle, I have the t square. C double brackets T and all these balls here, each of these balls is a fiber of the RV map and this one again is split off into smaller balls and so on. So you get a little kind of, I mean these rings of balls, these are exactly the fibers of the RV map. Okay, now I said that I want my I mean, I want this notion of VF minimality to work with arbitrary expansions of the language on, well, the combination of residue field and value group. So what I really mean is I want to allow arbitrary expansions of RV, of the language on RV. So this in particular means that, I mean, if I allow, if in my language I just put in a predicate for an arbitrary subset of RV, this means that as a definable set, I can create an arbitrary union of any choice of those balls here. So for example, I could have all the orange balls, so I'm drawing some random set of balls in orange. This set of orange balls might be definable in some structure which I would like to be VF minimal. So you might, I mean, this might be a bit frightening because in O minimality, your definable set subset of the line look very simple, whereas here it gets something really complicated. But so let's just impose this here. I mean, that's I, I, I guess it's somehow the best possible we can hope is things like this. Now let me start writing down the definition of VF minimality, um, having this here in mind. And for this, I first need some preliminary definitions. So let 
C subset of K be finite, and then I def define an equivalence relation coming from the C here, where X and X prime are in K. I say that they're equivalent if and only if for every element of my set C, Rv of x minus C is equal to Rv of x prime minus C. So let's, let's have a look at what this is saying. So if, let's take C to be only the element 0, then what I'm writing here is I'm just saying Rv of x equals Rv of x prime. So in this case, the equivalence classes are exactly the balls I've drawn here. So so it's these balls here, and then the smaller balls here, and then the even smaller balls, and so on. So actually, if you want, these are exactly also another point of view you can take is exactly the maximal balls which don't contain zero. I mean, this looks maybe a bit strange in this picture, but recall that we have this ultrametric, um, um, well, but we have an ultrametric. So if I take this ball, for example, I want to make it bigger, then it will automatically have to contain already this ball here, which contains zero. So these balls here are exactly the maximal balls not containing zero. So some maximal balls in K without zero. And more generally, and I mean, Essentially, what's, what's, okay, first maybe what do I get if I take non, something non-zero here? If I take one, for example, then this will, I will get exactly the same picture, but shifted to one. So I get shifted versions of this picture. And so now if I take a two element set, say with zero and one, then I'm saying I have to be in the equivalence class with respect to zero in the same one with respect to zero and in the same with respect to one. So I just take intersection of equivalence classes. So my one maybe is here. So then the corresponding picture shifted to one will give me such things here. But the bigger balls will be the same anyway. So, um, so the balls I've drawn here in this picture now, this would correspond to the equivalence classes for the set C consisting of zero and one. And um, in general, the equivalence classes, and here you see the balls I have here now, these are the maximal balls which are, contain neither zero nor one. So equivalence classes are maximal balls B, which are disjoint from my set C. OK, so I hope this gives a little bit of an intuition of what, I'm, what the equivalence classes are here. OK, and then I define a subset x, subset of k is um, prepared by c. And c is, again, a finite set. if it is a union of equivalence classes. Finite or non, or non, the union, I mean, 
the, the union here doesn't need to be finite. Um, so, yeah. Okay, and so I claim that any set which is prepared is definable in some expansion of my language, whatever my starting language was, um, if, I mean, in some expansion on RV. So, I mean, for example, so let me, let me, okay, this, I, I think I should draw the picture again. Let me take C equal zero, one. I just draw the same picture again since this one became a little bit messy. So, so these are the equivalence classes. I can choose an arbitrary subset of the equivalence classes and paint them in orange. And this is my set X. And well, how can I define, I mean, I can simply first remove this ball here and look at the, the remainder of X. This here is now just a pre-image under RV of some subset of, um, of some subset of RV. So this set is definable using its image. I mean, if, if I take the image of this thing here in RV, I put a predicate for this into the language, then this thing, thing here becomes definable. And similarly, if I remove this here, I can also define this part here now by shifting it by one. So a set like this here is definable. So what I'm trying to tell you is if I want to define a notion of VF minimality by specifying what subset of K are allowed to be, and if I want to allow arbitrary expansion on RV, then I have to allow any prepared set as being definable. So there's no way around this. So let's do it like this. Um, now I need um, this. So, definition, K with my, in some language, K is VF minimal. If um, for every definable, set x subset of k, um, there exists a finite um, let me leave some space for later maybe um, set c in k preparing my set x. Um, Okay, so that's first version of the definition, and it turns out that with this definition, one, well, at least we were not yet able to do useful things with this. And the first thing is that we need control of parameters, as I told you. So what we wa want to put in is if our set is A definable, and A is a subset of K, then there exists a finite A definable set C preparing X. Okay, that's already a bit better. Um, actually, I forgot, I should also say that we do not only want this to hold for K, but also for elementarily equivalent structures. So um, the same 
should hold for k prime elementarily equivalent to k. So that's, I mean, for O minimality, that's automatic. If one field is O minimal, then also the others. In this setting, it's not. OK, and unfortunately, that's still not enough control of parameters here. So um, let me say it like this. Um, so we need also to allow our set X here to be definable with parameters from RV. So let's put a subset of K union RV. Okay, still not good enough. Um, we want that C doesn't use the parameters from RV. Even if a, um, X uses the parameters from RV, the set C which prepares it should not use them. So what does it mean? So uh, in particular, this means that undefinable maps from RV to the valued field to K have finite range. Why this? Let's, let, let's check this maybe carefully. Um, I mean, if I have a definable map like this here, then I have the definable set x, x xi maybe, which is just defined of, as f of xi. So this is definable with some parameter from RV. So it should be prepared by well, it's, first of all, it's definable, so it has to be prepared. Now, this set X is just a singleton. And the only way to prepare a singleton is by putting the singleton into the set C. I don't know whether that's clear. I mean, a set is prepared if and only if it's a, it's a union of equivalence classes. And the only equivalence classes which are singletons are the elements of C themselves. I mean, these points in the middle here. And this one, well, I didn't exactly hit it. Um, OK, so this means here, so this is prepared. If, if C prepares this thing here, so C prepares this here, implies that C contains this point here. And now this here, here I have my, this is, if you want, this is a family of sets parameterized by RV, and now using a compactness argument um, and using that the definition of C should not use this chi here, you can get a single set chi which works for all f of chi. And so compactness, so oh, by compactness, a single C works for all chi, and this is just saying that all images of F lie in my finite set C here. Okay, and unfortunately this is still not enough, but we're getting very close. So there's one little more modification which I need to make. So I guess I should make it on the other blackboard. Why do you want C to be definable? Sorry? Why, isn't it, why do you want C to be definable? Why wouldn't you just take finite set? Well, I, I need, well, I need for, for various compactness arguments, I need to be able to do things uniformly in families. And so therefore, I need it to be defined with the same parameters as x. OK, and so. The last thing I need to do is um, yeah, maybe let me do this on the other blackboard. Like 
So here I had my maximal ideal, but I mean, you can also instead, I mean, the maximal ideal here, let me write it, this is the set of x such that valuation of x is, is bigger than 0. Instead of taking bigger than 0, I could also take bigger than lambda for any given lambda. So say, well, any, but it should be positive maybe, or bigger or equal to 0. So we fix a lambda bigger or equal to 0, and then I can define rv lambda to be this thing here. And I have a map rv lambda, which goes from here to here. So in this example, for example, it would mean that instead of just fixing the first um, digit here, I'm fixing the first two or first three, or well, first lambda ones, first lambda plus one, first lambda plus one ones. Okay, so I can do this. And then I can accordingly modify all my definitions. I can do this here with lambdas here. And so, okay, maybe I don't try to draw an example here. I mean, the example here now would be that each of these balls is separated a little bit into smaller balls, but not too much. And so, and it's, now it's not true anymore that equivalence classes are exactly maximal balls. It's kind of slightly smaller than maximal balls, something like this. But let me remove this here. But then I can have a notion of being lambda prepared if x is a union of C lambda equivalence classes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is lambda is bigger or equal to zero, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Sorry? Why are you doing Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I now say why I am doing this. So now, so what I want to say now is, so for every definable set here, and now I want the set to be definable with parameters from RV lambda. And lambda is also any lambda big or equal to zero. Then I want also, I mean, so I want to allow parameters from RV lambda, and I want this to be definable, uh, to be prepared. The thing is, in this way, there's no chance that it will be true. Because, I mean, for example, I, if I take the, I mean, I have my fixed lambda, and I can take the set x xi just to be the pre-image. So xi is now an element of rv lambda. Um, and I take the pre-image of xi. So this will be just one of the balls, if you want. And again, by some compactness, so this should be prepared. And by compactness, it's prepared. I can again find a single C, which does not depend on lambda. So um, independent of lambda. So, but now, if I take all the fibers of my RV lambda, I can certainly, I mean, they look kind of well, okay, let me not say it in too much detail. It's rather easy to see that they can certainly not be prepared in the sense I wrote here. And the reasonable thing to expect and which works is that it's not prepared in the previous sense, but only that it's lambda prepared. Okay, and this is the full definition. Okay, and now I spent a lot of time of telling you the definition, and now I should at least tell you what it's also useful for. So, um, or maybe I should already, so I already said kind of what it's supposed to work for. So this, so this does work, so examples of, of VF minimal fields or structures, So any Hanselian 
valued field of characteristic 0, 0, and also 0p, but this requires a slight modified version of the definition, so it's a bit more technical. Uh, also, 0p for variant. And then you can add analytic structure, analytic functions in suitable sense. So there's a, for example, there's a paper by Klüker's Lipschitz where they define fields with analytic structure. So any such field is VF minimal. So plus analytic. And another class of fields which works nicely is there's a notion of um, T con, so how should I say it? So if you start with an O minimal structure on R, and you take a non-standard model, and you take the convex closure of this inside this, so this is my K, and OK is the convex closure of R, then this structure which you obtain by putting this into, so you take the entire language of O, min, of, um, your entire o minimal language here, you add a predicate for this valuation ring here, that's what, that's a t-convex structure, and those things are also VF minimal, so Well, that's not entirely true. It's VF minimal provided that the original thing was polynomially bounded. So let me put here polynomially bounded. Okay, so this was just to give some interesting examples. And now, what are the consequences? Um, So maybe the first kind of consequence is an O minimal field is automatically real closed. And in this setting here, an VF minimal valued field is automatically Hanselian. So I mean, that's maybe not the consequence one is interested in, but it's maybe nice nevertheless. Um, And more, more precisely, you also have definable spherically completeness. Maybe I don't want to go too much into details. OK. And well, the most important thing is maybe that you have, well, now we do get nice geometric behavior of definable sets and functions. So we have a notion of dimension, which behaves really nice in all the ways you can expect. Um, we have a notion of cell decomposition, which is rather technical. And definable functions are almost everywhere differentiable. And actually, this, OK, this is again, I mean, it's quite a nice analog to O minimality. But in valued fields, this is not a strong enough condition to work with because, I mean, differentiable means somehow that your function can be approximated by some linear function. But since my valued field is totally disconnected, this says very little. <coughs> and so, um, and now this connects a little bit to also what Françoise said yesterday. She was mentioning some kind of, uh, I don't recall whether she, how she called it, it was a kind of local um, 
I mean, factoring over the value, gr value group, well, I'm formulating it differently. I would say the final function can be approximated by Taylor series. So in this case, what we have for the moment is Taylor series of degree one. So, um, okay, maybe, yeah, maybe I have. So let me, let, let me write it. So actually, this is, that's somehow our main theorem. So let me maybe write it precisely. So f, if I have a definable function, then there exists, I mean, OK, this finite number of points where the function is not differentiable. Um, so there's finite, let's, let me call it, well, maybe the set is bigger than just the points where it's not dif differentiable, but anyway, a finite set of evil points. Such that, um, so, um, where did I write it down? Um, so, for every ball B disjoint from C, so I hope you notice that this looks similar to things we've seen before. So again, I can draw my picture, my set, let's say that my set C is a single point here, and then I have lots of balls which are disjoint from this point. And on each of these balls, my function can be well approximated by a Taylor expansion of degree one. So, or if you want, close to linear. So for every ball B, um, we have the following. For every x0 and x in B, f, at, I mean, I'm writing a kind of Taylor series around x0, so f of x equals f of x0 plus x minus x0 times f prime of x0 plus some error term. Sorry, f prime, the derivative. So in particular here, this I'm saying that f does have a derivative away from my set C. And the error term, um, so this epsilon is as small as one might, one would maybe expect. So it's something like, goes like, uh, goes, I mean, um, becomes small like this difference squared. Um, and then, well, I guess, I, well, I mean, let me just write down the formula. I need to also put in the valuation of the derivative. And then it might look a little bit technical. I mean, if you try out an example, you will notice that you need some additional correcting term here where this mu here is the radius of B. Let me, let me just write radius of B here. So valuative radius. OK, so you get this kind of Taylor approximation. And yes, and this is kind of the key, I mean, this is now a a powerful ingredient, which is kind of the key ingredient, I would say, to many of the big theorems, which have then been proven, like, I mean, all the applications I wanted to get, like, motivic integration and so on. It's a kind of good approximability of the final functions by linear functions. Okay, and now to end, let me just mention a few more little side remarks. So, um, so I said I wanted this to be a relative notion. So, and it is indeed relative in the following sense. If k is Vf minimal, then indeed, if I expand the language arbitrarily on, the, on Rv, it still stays Vf minimal. And that's something, I mean, 
if you know this, for example, the proof of quantified elimination of, I mean, uh, DNF pass quantified elimination, there you also know that, the, I mean, the quantified elimination, if you add anything on RV, it's, you still have the quantified elimination, but you st always have to redo the proof. And I always found this kind of unsatisfactory that you have to do the proof again. And in this case, you don't have to redo the proof. If you have something VF minimally, minimal, you automatically get that RV expansions are RV minimal. Okay, and I don't need to redo the proof. It's just if I prove that once I know that this is VF minimal, it follows that any expansion is also VF minimal. The definition is made in such a way that this follows, yes. Okay, yes, and then, okay, let me, so let me just say, also if you cause the evaluation, it stays VF minimal, and since the time is over, thanks for your attention.